Milepost 31 in Pioneer Square is the starting place for tours of the Seattle Deep Bore Tunnel Project, where displays and graphics explain what is happening and how the work will proceed. The media and public was given a tour of the actual work site by tunnel officials on September 6th. So we are standing in the middle of old Alaskan Way. We shifted Alaskan Way under the viaduct. We just crossed it. It didn't used to be there. The reason we did that is we have to do a whole bunch of work in the footprint of where we're standing right here because the tunnel is going to go right underneath of where we stand. If you look up to the north, you can see the viaduct and you can see how sections of it look a little brighter and quiet quieter than the parts to the south. Those are areas that we're cleaning so that we can put some structural reinforcement on the superstructure of the bridge because the viaduct turns, the tunnel keeps going straight. It goes underneath the viaduct at Yesler Way. The viaduct is not in great shape. We would prefer that it stays standing up as we tunnel on it. Uh, underneath. One of our goals, of course, was to keep the viaduct open during replacement. The way we're going to ensure that we do that, we're going to do some strengthening of the viaduct, which is temporary in nature, does nothing for seismic resistance, stays just as vulnerable in an earthquake. So clearly once the tunnel is done at the end of 2015, our next task is to remove the viaduct along the central waterfront as rapidly as we can. So from, from with, with that, that point being made, let's move on to our first station, at which I will turn it over to Chris Bambridge to talk about the, the uh, underground measures we're doing to uh, prep and protect the ground in the, this, this area. The public can take self-guided tours as well that extend a mile down Alaska Way. As Matt was saying, we're standing approximately on the, the line of the tunnel passes Essentially down the Alaskan Way, the Malcolm drilling rig here is about on the center line of the tunnel. The, the tunnel will start from where those drill rigs are. You can just see the one operating and you'll, uh, Chris Dixon will explain some of the working is going on down there. So the first section of the tunnel, we start underground and we start... Thank you. Willing helper. So the, the tunnel starts going down on a 4% gradient from the starting position back there. The, we're sitting on alluvial fill. The fill material that came from Denny's regrade. There used to be water underneath us here. The bedrock, not the, the natural ground, is probably some 30 or 40 feet below us. So in this location, we have, uh, we have to protect the, the viaduct as we're doing the excavation. And the way that we're doing that, we're putting rows of concrete piles, five feet diameter circular cylinders of concrete to the left and to the right of the tunnel. So that is what these drill rigs are starting to do here. You can start see the, the one that's working down there. That's one side of the, of the tunnel box. The other side of the tunnel box is next to the viaduct. So imagine two vertical walls of concrete and the tunnel machine goes down between those two vertical walls, increasing in depth as we go. Now the reason we put those vertical walls of concrete there is to protect the infrastructure, the viaduct, and the city utilities and the buildings to the left, the port infrastructure, as we start excavating down and we get down eventually into the natural ground and that happens about 150 feet north of where we are at the moment. The, also across the city street here there's a lot of uh, city infrastructure. We have, we have water, drinking water, electric and wastewater and the works that's going on just in King, end of King Street here there is a sewer line which crosses to this little building you can see and that's a, a regulator system for the sewage system and we're strengthening those those sewer pipes so that the tunnel machine can tunnel underneath them the system the phrase that we've coined for this is the process we're going to be using is tunnel in a box it's not a normal process it's a process that we've been developed by the contractor for this project 
to provide specific protection to the viaduct and the other infrastructure that we have. Also, as the tunnel is, is, taking, is, is going down at the 4% gradient, the engineers and the management team need to know how, what is happening to the ground itself. So there's a range of instruments that we'll be putting onto buildings, onto the viaduct, and deep into the ground so that we know how the ground is moving in relation to the tunnel machine as it moves forwards. So these instruments, and you may see them, uh, they're just about starting to be installed over, over the next few months throughout the city. And there's white theodolites, uh, total station theodolites, which will be on a building. And these are automatic and will be able to rotate and take many readings. One instrument can take up to four, can monitor 400 or so instruments, taking one reading every few minutes. So that gives feedback to the office so we can actually uh, see what's happening to the surface, what's happening to, to buildings, what's happening to the ground, to see if it's all within the controlled limits that we have set and we've designed for in the, in the project. The uh, reason we're building the launch pit is to uh, provide a place for us to basically assemble the tunnel boring machine underground in an open pit and then drive through the north wall of that pit to start tunneling, after which we'll continue up Alaskan Way uh, as Chris described at the last uh, stop. Uh, the launch pit, uh, to construct that, we install these sea cap piles. You can see the rig over here uh, working on that. Uh, you see the steel cans a little further up the tracks? Those are five foot diameter steel cans. And what these rigs do is they, uh, they turn the can in the ground. There's cutting teeth on the bottom of the can, and the can advances down into the ground, and then they insert a drill inside the can to remove the dirt from inside the can. And they do that incrementally. They advance the can, clean it out, advance the can, clean it out. When they get one can in, they add another can on top, and they just keep adding cans until they have a can extending all the way uh, about 80 to 100 feet in the ground that's been emptied by the drill. Once they reach that point, they uh, drop a rebar cage into the can. You can see some rebar cages beyond the launch pit over there. Uh, they drop the rebar cage into the, into the can and then they start filling the can with Tremi concrete and they start concreting from the bottom all the way up to the surface. As the concrete rises, they extract those sections of the can that they installed as they were drilling the can into the ground. So when we're complete, we have the can back outside ready for another hole and we've got a five foot diameter concrete column extending uh, 100 feet into the ground, reinforced concrete. Uh, if you look across there, you can see some light colored rebar. It's tan in color. That's fiberglass rebar. When we install these secan piles at the head wall of the launch pit that we're going to tunnel through, instead of using steel, we use fiberglass for reinforcement. And that allows the machine to cut through the concrete and the reinforcing and start the tunnel drive. If we uh, use steel rebar there, it'd be very, very difficult for the TVM to get through. Um, we've completed all of the launch, all of the secant piles surrounding the launch pit. We're in the process of installing uh, beams along the perimeter of the launch pit and across the launch pit uh, to hold those secant piles in place as we start the excavation. As the excavation goes down, We'll install additional interior supports and also tiebacks to hold those secant walls in place. When we get to the bottom, we'll be constructing a special slab to assemble the TBM on and then start the tunnel drive. The uh, tunnel boring machine, it's uh, very large, it's 57 and a half feet in diameter. It's about 326 feet long. Uh, comes in several sections. The total weight of the machine is uh, 6,700 tons. We, uh, 
We're assembling the machine in Japan as we speak. Uh, Hitachi Zos and the TBM manufacturer started fabricating uh, the parts of the TBM. Um, they have a large facility uh, near Osaka, Japan, where the TBM is currently being assembled. I believe there's some photos in uh, mile post 31 of the TBM assembly. Uh, it takes about a year to do that. We signed a contract with Hitachi last October. Uh, they began shortly after that. Most of the uh, manufacturing is, is nearing completion and they've started the assembly. What they'll do for the balance of this year is assemble the entire machine and test it at their facility in Japan. Once it's tested, it gets disassembled for packing and shipping here to Terminal 46. We originally wanted to try to bring the machine in as large of pieces as possible because um, the fewer pieces you disassemble it into and then reassemble it, um, the less number of pieces you use, the better quality machine you get. It's like if uh, you bought a transmission for your car. If it's all in one piece, you put it in and it's pretty good. But if it comes in 40 pieces and you got to assemble it before you put it in your car, you probably aren't going to have as good a transmission as you would with the one big piece. We're looking at big pieces up to 3,500 tons each to put on a ship, bring here, transport over, and drop into the pit. But um, with the uh, capacity of the pier from a structural standpoint and, and the weight of these pieces, uh, we had to go with a smaller option. Um, our contract with Hitachi Zosen had a small piece and a large piece option. The large piece option were these large 3,500 ton maximum size pieces. We could have got the machine here in 8 to 10 pieces. The other option was to break it into many pieces. Uh, most uh, around a hundred tons and that would have been hundred and forty one pieces what we agreed was with uh, what we call a middle option where the largest pieces are nine hundred tons and it's going to arrive here in about forty pieces so uh, we're going to get a ship uh, bringing in forty pieces that get unloaded here transported across terminal forty six uh, arranged next to the launch pit and then lower it into the launch pit for assembly. All right, so we have a train track right behind us. This is a key example. That train crosses Atlantic Street. This is a train track that they use to build trains out of the Seattle International Gateway Rail Yard. The track is blocking Atlantic Street 30% of every 24-hour day. When it does that, all the freight traffic that wants to get to the freeway system, back and forth to Terminal 46 behind us, the Terminal 30 just south of us, it can't move. So one of the main reasons for, for large freight backups in this area right now is the fact that that train exists on this track as you see it now. These columns that we see here, the temporary rusty pipes that we see sticking up into the air, and the remaining three viaduct columns that you see behind me over on the left side, those are the start of construction on what we call the Atlantic Street Railroad Bypass Bridge. That was awarded recently to Atkinson Construction. We do have a representative of Atkinson Construction here. Uh, thank you for, uh, for, uh, for uh, helping us out here. Um, we're just starting construction on this bridge, and the sole function of that is when that train is blocking Atlantic Street, there's going to be a U-shaped bridge that will take traffic up and over not only SR-99, but up and over the train track, so that when that track is blocked, the train does not have to stop. It can just do a continual loop right up and over that track, and the uh, truck backups that we see in this area 30% of the time every day that routinely back up on the freeway, they back up on the I-5, I-90, I once we get that done, it's going to be a huge benefit to the port, it's going to be a huge benefit to the stadium, going to be a huge benefit to the community down here because there's one thing I've noticed out of uh, three plus years of construction down here, if the freight trucks don't move, no one moves. So. This is Pat Robinson for WestSeattleHerald.com.